So, in American history, Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt were classical realists in the ways in which they fought to end slavery in the United States and destroy totalitarian world domination. Let's talk about this. Lincoln and Roosevelt were willing to fight slavery and um, totalitarianism because they considered them to be evil. And they considered them to be evil because slave owners and totalitarian dictators want to deny us of our freedom. free will. Free will. Not just freedoms, our free will. Free will, right. Therefore, they want to deny us our humanity, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. So that's why they were willing to fight to end slavery and fight to, to uh, end totalitarian domination of the world. But Lincoln and, Ro and Roosevelt understood that it wasn't, just, it wasn't good enough simply to oppose slavery and totalitarianism. The beginning of the Civil War, for example, it wasn't clear that the Union was going to emerge victorious. There were elements in the North that really didn't care about the immorality of slavery. And there were also these, these, these border states like uh, Kansas and Missouri and um, Maryland who wanted to be on the fence. Some of the people in these states approved of slavery and actually had slaves, and some were hotly opposed to it. So they remained border states. And Lincoln, who opposed slavery and wanted to abolish it, knew that if he played up that opposition, it would force these border states onto the side of the Confederacy, and then therefore make it more difficult, if not impossible, to win the war. So despite the fact that Lincoln, remember we went to see, did you come with us to see the movie? That, that movie was done very well. So despite the fact that he knew from the very beginning that he was, he was fighting this war to end slavery, he knew he had to downplay this. And that's what he did, as this movie. So, and then you gave me a, a tape of it, right? I keep watching it over and over again. He, wanted, he didn't want anyone to really understand completely what his purpose was. Families were not going to allow their sons, their brothers, and brothers to die in slavery when they weren't sure that they opposed slavery. So Lincoln had to keep this on the down low. By 1864, when it was clear to everyone, even the South, that the Confederacy was going to lose, it, he didn't have to keep so quiet anymore. And now he becomes clearer, starting with the Emancipation Proclamation and on. And then the passage of the 13th Amendment. That basically was what that was about, that movie, which abolished slavery. Now, when it was, he didn't need the explicit support of all these people in the North and all these people in the border states, he could just be honest about it. It was a fait accompli. So here's an example of mixing a moral ideal, opposition to slavery because it, it's an attempt to rob <coughs> human beings of their humanity, and that's evil. It could be nothing more evil than that. With a recognition of the importance of the material circumstances, public opinion in these states from which he needed his, his, their support. Okay? The emphasis was on the ultimate moral goal, ending slavery, but he didn't ignore the material circumstances. Okay? That movie dealt with that so beautifully. As far as Roosevelt was concerned, he knew that Hitler and Mussolini and Hirohito, these totalitarian bastards, 
wanted to conquer, they were megalomaniacs, which means they wanted to conquer the entire world. They ultimately wanted to conquer the United States and rob Americans of their free will, rob Americans of their humanity. Nothing could be more evil than that. <clears throat> but in the late 1930s and early 1940s, <coughs> Americans didn't see this as a problem for them, a practical problem for them. They saw it only as a practical problem for Africans and Europeans and Asians. And families didn't want their sons, their brothers, you understand, to die for other people's problems. Roosevelt, using his mind and imagination, could see that it wasn't going to be too, too long between these totalitarian leaders were going to defeat all these other nations that were going to be heading towards the United States. So he knew that we had to enter the war not only to help the people in Europe, for example, and in China, but to help ourselves. But he knew that he couldn't persuade the American people to share his imaginative conclusion, right? So what he had to do was he had to uh, do everything he could to persuade Japan and, and uh, Germany to attack the United States. At that point, Americans would have no choice but to join World, join World War II. In other words, make it a world war. So the first thing he did was he provided arms to the British. Do you remember, did you remember your history, the Lend-Lease program, etc.? I mean, it wasn't even secret. He was giving arms to England <coughs> to defend itself. As far as Japan was concerned, this is an island. It doesn't have many um, homegrown materials, so they have to import oil, they have to import food, you understand? And he, Roosevelt did his best to block the importation of those products to Japan. In other words, he was daring Germany and he was daring Japan to attack us. And then finally Japan fell into the trap, <laughs> and that was the end of it. Roosevelt had a strong enough mind's eye, a strong enough imagination to see, number one, how evil totalitarianism was, and number two, how it was heading towards the United States. Even, most, uh, even though most people really didn't think in those terms, most Americans didn't think in those terms. And after all, we are in a democracy and people have their vote and can choose senators and representatives and presidents. So Roosevelt knew that in the late 1930s and early 1940s, if he said to the American people, we're going to join this war against uh, Hitler and Hir Hirohito, the American people would throw him out of office. Right? Yeah. So again, he had to downplay his moral ideal and appreciate very well the lack of imagination on the part, which is a material, concrete fact, the lack of imagination on the part of the American voter. Do we need more insight into that than what's been happening in our, recently in our own lives? Don't you hear over and over again every night on TV, but somebody says, I can't, I can't believe Trump is doing this. And then the reporter will say, did you vote for him? And they say, yes, I did when it was as clear as could be. Yeah. So that's the material representation, not this ideal voter, but the, but, but the concrete American voter who, when he asked about these world problems, is simply thinking about, I love my son George, and I don't want him to die in a battlefield in the Far East or in Europe. So they mixed and matched the abstraction and the, and the uh, concrete reality very, very well. Okay? Mm -hmm. 
in contrast to the um, classical realists are the um, All these notes here are the materialists or cynics. Materialists deny the reality of abstract ideals. The cynics are, are selfish because the most material thing about us is ourselves. If you deny the existence, if you completely deny the existence of abstract ideals, you're only concerned about your physical well-being. And if you're only concerned about your physical well-being, you're selfish. So cynics ignore the universal standard of the square in favor of the concrete square. Let's use the example of the golden rule. Tell me, remember the golden rule? Which serves as the foundation for all morality in Western civilization. Yes, you do think of it. I'll start you off. Do unto. Help her out. Do unto others as you would have them do unto yeah. you. Oh, okay. Now you remember? Yeah, I just didn't know it was called the golden rule. Okay, well, great. Let's see, what did I do with that? Let's, let's use this. describe it is, love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, in this famous golden rule, what neighbor is being referred to here? Is it Hacker? Um, well, the neighbor would be referring... Is it referring to Hacker? Who's that? Me. Oh. Um, I guess it, it refers to everyone that you meet. It refers, refers to everyone you know? It refers to everyone you know, but not just everyone you know, or just him. It refers to all human beings who ever lived, who are living now and who ever lived. That's what neighbor refers to in the Golden Rule. Love thy neighbor as thyself, or others do unto others. It refers not only to your mother or Noah, but it refers to all human beings who are living now and who ever lived. That's the abstract part of the golden rule. Because you couldn't have a, possibly have a physical relationship with all people who ever lived, right? Right. Yeah. But the physical part is yourself. You just grab a hold of your skin and pinch it. That's my uh, favorite part of uh, Lindman is where he makes that distinction. He talks about uh, the American people not being a plurality of the voters, but it being all the Americans that have ever been, yeah. are, and will ever be. Exactly. 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 So here is classical realism. Look what comes first, or look what is the 40%, the abstraction, neighbor, but not to the exclusion of thyself. Okay, you look quizzical, so ask me a question. For classical realism, reality is made up of the abstract ideal mm -hmm. and also the material representations of those abstract ideals. So here, with the emphasis on the abstract ideal, so the abstraction comes first 
but not to the exclusion of your material self. What's more important, loving the neighbor or loving the self? Well, what is it, according to the way that's described or written, which is more important? Neighbor. You what say you? ads. I mean, the, the loving yourself had to, you have to have a concept of loving yourself first. You have to develop that concept before you can love your neighbor, right? As yourself. So, I mean, I know it's in well. Order. That's one. That's an excellent question, and 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 it's 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 one that people have difficulty with for good reason. According to the Golden Rule, you can't truly love yourself until you love your neighbor. We live in such a selfish How would I know that, though? Just, how would I know that, though, just by reading that? Well, you would know it from reading it, but you would also know it through your imagination. See, in our culture, what we see, we say is, you're asking a wonderful question. What we say is, you can't love others until you first truly love yourself. Yeah, you hear that a lot. We hear that a lot. Because that's the way we feel. After all, we're materialists and relativists. And we're the most material thing about ourselves. Do people really have to learn how to love themselves? No, I don't think so. Um, well, let's put, let's give an example. I think avoiding pain is like the basis of that. We have Perhaps, to but, but, have a love. But let's talk about this for a second. What about a terribly depressed person who spends her life or his life thinking from day to night, woe is me, woe is me? Is that a form of loving yourself, even though it, it manifests itself in depression? Yeah, because you're thinking more about how you feel about Who? yourself. You're only caring about yourself. Now, it may not be your fault right. in the case of some sure, chemical enough. imbalance in your brain, but that's how it manifests itself. You're only thinking about yourself. And how your behavior affects the people around you. You're not thinking think about that. that. I, don't, I don't think depressed people are that worried about it. Depressed people do some horrible things to other people. I mean, isn't it true that all these guys that go into grade schools and shoot them up are terribly depressed people? Yes, generally. Woe is me, woe is me. So the traditional Western view, again associated with Plato and Aristotle and Moses and Jesus, etc., goes something like this. You can't love yourself in real terms unless you love others. I mean, isn't that really the basis of charity? Charity isn't just for other people. It's also for yourself. Because for the first time in your life, you have good reason to care about yourself. Because of the good that you're doing. But we say the opposite. We say you can't love others until you love yourself. And Jesus and Moses and Plato and Aristotle say human beings do not have to learn to love themselves. We love ourselves all the time. We have to love others first before we can truly love ourselves. Before we can really deserve to love ourselves. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Are we trying to make ourselves worth loving by that's the, being good to other people? That's the excellent, excellent. You just trust it better than I could. Well, don't you have to actually learn to love first? Well, what is love? You have to learn what is the meaning of love. So what do you think the meaning of love is? You can't act to love unless you understand what it means. So what does it mean? Describe, 
Well, it, it, all abstract ideals are hard to describe. What does it have to do with caring about other people? Yes, and it has to do with caring about yourself. It's like well, the question is, do you deserve to care about yourself if you don't care about other people? Not at all. Well, not according to the traditional view. But in America, we say it is, that you have to concentrate on yourself. For, for Moses and Aristotle, Christ and Plato, if you begin to the process of loving yourself, Hacker, when will that process end and you can begin to love others? Never. Well, that's the point. Now, you may disagree, and clearly contemporary American culture disagrees with that view. But that's the old view. That if you get on the road to loving yourself, that's a road that you will never get off. That's a ride that you'll never get off. You're already doing that. And the supposition is, is that you'll never stop doing it until you give up yourself to others. That doesn't mean that you stop loving yourself. It means now, for the first time, you can say, I deserve to care about myself. So, um, a good example, if, if Plato and Aristotle represent good examples of classical realism, then I guess uh, a very famous cynic in the history of Western thought would be whom? Machiavelli. You got it. What about cynicism in American history? Well, how about uh, when Roosevelt signed an order to uh, imprison, imprison hundred, uh, over 100,000 of Americans, American citizens of Japanese descent during World War II only because they were Japanese? You know about that, don't you? Japanese attorneys. Yeah, yeah. Over 100,000. These were American citizens. In D.C., the Smithsonian had a, had a special exhibit on that. Isn't that horrible? Nixon's behavior during Watergate. It's just a denial of moral standards completely. I'm not a crook, he said. Of course he was a crook. And the most recent one is this. What is the reason, do you suspect, Brantley, that Trump absolutely refuses to, uh, even though every other president has done it, to, to reveal his uh, and release his tax return, federal tax returns? What is, what is the... He's, I, I, he has to have something to hide. What is it? What is the suspicion? Ties to Russian Russia, oligarchs. Russian pods. Yeah. That, you know... A guy like Trump, who's a shyster, never spends his own money when he builds a hotel. You understand? I mean, that's how these guys get so rich. You know that, don't you? Yeah. Do you know that, Brent? Mm -hmm. Never. They use other people's money. And this guy builds so much stuff that we're talking about, not millions, we're talking about billions of dollars. So the suspicion is that these billions of dollars have come from Russian oligarchs with close ties to Putin. I mean, how else would somebody, how else would you explain that an American president would say, I trust Putin more than our international security experts? Did you see that clip? Yes. He, uh, he thinks that he believes that Putin believes that when he tells him that he believes he didn't have anything to do with it, that he believes him. The suspicion is that he owes so much money to these turkeys that they have uh, holding him hostage. 
I mean, that's a rational explanation, if there is a national, rational explanation for anything this guy does. Now, if that's the case, that would be the lowest behavior of any American president by far, even worse than Roosevelt and even worse than Nixon. You talk about the term conflict of interest, holy miracle. Well, I suspect, and, I, and, and millions of Americans suspect that that's the case. Everything else that's going on pales in significance to that guy Mueller revealing those tax returns. He'd have to be impeached within a week. I mean, I don't think it would even take that long. Well, I mean, somebody has to know. I mean, his tax returns have to be of course. somewhere. So it's not like this is something that we don't know. Can, can the Mueller? people doing the investigation subpoena the tax returns? Of course. Have they done that? Well, see, we don't know because this guy keeps a lot of things secret, secret as he's supposed to do. I just don't understand why he's not making them public at this point. <coughs> We're talking about billions of dollars now. That seems all very shady to me. Well, that would, I mean, that would make Japanese internment as horrible as it was, and that would make Watergate as horrible as it was look like child's play. You can understand the reasons for those things, even though they were wrong, you can understand. What can I understand? The reasons for Japanese internment. I can understand the... What's the reason? Fear, right? Fear? Yeah, or but misguided then, fear? Well, irrational fear. Irrational but, fear? Yeah, but presidents are supposed to be above irrational fear. Yeah, okay, well, I mean, it's supposed to be, but... Well, but that's the point, I mean, so... I mean, Nothing to fear, but... Yeah. But uh, yeah, irrational fear wouldn't be the reason why Donald Trump would uh, engage in a job where he knew his previous business dealings would be a conflict of interest. That wasn't him making a decision as a president. These other decisions that were made were made as a president, like Watergate. He, the decision he, was I'm running for president, even though I know I'm beholden in the t in, to the tune of billions of dollars to Russian oligarchs with close ties to Putin. Right. Well, because because right. I'm beholden, this will be a way that I can like. So I mean, he did this to himself before he ever even became president. So all I'm saying is. There's nothing wrong for owing money to people if you're that kind of a shyster businessman. Was something wrong with then becoming the leader of the free world when you owe money to totalitarian thugs? That's what's wrong. Where you're in control. And there's no way a I budget could that's, or at least influential over a budget that is. Of course. Staggering. Of course. So, yeah. so when you say I understand. I don't understand Why Trump. Roosevelt imprisoned those Japanese? Right. No, no, I don't understand it. These, there was nothing. They didn't do anything wrong. And if it was fear, it was an irrational fear. Right. But I don't think there was an irrational fear involved in Trump's situation. Maybe a irrational uh, sense of. I can get away with it. Let me see if I can explain myself. I understand that Roosevelt gave in to the irrational fear of people living on the West Coast that those Americans would betray the United States. I understand that he gave in to it, but I realize that that's a cowardly thing to do. Okay. I understand why Nixon uh, lied uh, about Watergate because he wanted to win the, 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 the 1972 election, but that's an unethical thing to do. And understand that Trump wanted to have it both ways. He wanted to be indebted to the tune of billions of dollars to Russian oligarchs and be the President of the United States, but that's an unethical thing to do, an unpatriotic thing to do. So when you say, I understand it, 
that really doesn't explain it. I understand that it was immoral. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm, yeah. I'm not saying that I agree with it or that I think it was a good choice. But it's, I don't know. I guess I'm thinking, I, I'm... I understand I'm that like Trump Roosevelt wanted to have his... and even maybe Nixon had better faulty reasoning <laughs> for what they did than Trump. Maybe that's just a personal bias of mine or something. So that, that's that's all I'm saying. What you could what you could say was the consequences of Nixon's immoral behavior. <laughs> unconstitutional and immoral behavior and the consequences of Roosevelt's immoral and unconstitutional behavior are not as bad, the consequences are not as bad as Trump's behavior. That's the way to put it. Would you agree? I have to think about whether that's true or not. Yeah. I'd have to think about that. But, I mean, yeah, I could say it that way. All right, let's save the second half of this. So now we have to go to um, idealism and pragmatism. But okay. let's save it for the next time. When do you want to do it the next time? Well, think about it, and he'll write me an email. And we'll yeah. do it. Um, I'll try to fit you, fit you into my very busy schedule. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> when's your estimated time of we go, departure? We have to go up in the beginning of December. We have to go up to uh, Georgia and, and help to take care of the kids again for about uh, two weeks. Thank you.